My name is Eliza Leone. I'm the registered dietitian that works with restaurant associates at HMS. So I wanted to also introduce our marketing manager, Lorella. She can say hi for a second. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm the marketing manager here at uh, HMS. I'm very happy to be here. It's going to be my first VTK. So Lorella is helping us out behind the scenes. So today's class, we already talked about Thanksgiving, but that's what this is intended for. This recipe is a really great option to add to a Thanksgiving or a holiday meal because it's not like any other recipes that you probably already have on the table. This is a vegetarian dish and it's got plenty of uh, satisfying ingredients and filling ingredients so that you can eat this as an entree. This could be a side or an entree, however you like. So we've got a lot of things going on in here. We always say you should all have the recipe that was included in the invitation, but we always say that you can modify, we encourage you to modify this however you like. Uh, if you like more cinnamon on your squash, if you want to avoid added salt, you know, there are so many ways you can modify this based on what you like. So uh, a few safety things up front. So if, you know, if and when you're cooking along with us with this uh, recipe, please make sure that you are very careful with sharp knives. And always keep in mind that a dull knife is actually more dangerous than a sharp knife because it slips and can cut your hand. A sharp knife gets a good grip on your food. Um, also make sure that you've got an oven mitt and things like that handy for the oven. As I'm sticking things in the oven and taking them out, I'll be leaving the camera and Lorella will be filling in for the short time that I'm gone. And also something, again, another great thing about this being a vegetarian recipe is that we don't have to worry about like uh, cross-contamination with raw chicken or the order for those of you that attended our last class, we had to be very careful about preparing all the vegetables and produce first and then the raw fish. But this time, everything here is safe to be eaten as is. So we don't have to worry about that. So that's one of the many good things about plant cooking, plant-based cooking. You don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. So uh, any questions before I get into it? No? All right. So uh, a couple other people just joined, I think. So any anybody cooking along, let us know now, just so we know. OK, got it. So. First ingredient that we're working with is a delicata squash. So I'm going to hold it up here. Delicata squash is a type of winter squash, and it's got delicate skin. That's why it's called that. And uh, what we're going to do is, let me see, I'm going to cut into this lengthwise. And winter squashes are always tricky because they're so, you know, dense. So you always have to be very careful with those. But what we're doing is cutting it lengthwise, and then we're gonna scoop out these seeds and we're gonna use those as a part of our recipe so we don't end up wasting them. So I'm gonna use a spoon here and I'm gonna grab a little bowl. This is something that you can do with any kind of winter squash. Uh, also, you know, carving pumpkins for Halloween. That's something my mom always used to do when I was a kid. She would always roast the seeds while we carved pumpkins. So we're gonna scoop all these out. And so winter squash, while I'm doing this, winter squash is called that for two reasons. It's called that because it's harvested in the winter time or leading up to the winter time. It's also called that because it's hardy enough that it lasts for a few months into the winter. So that's different than like zucchini, which if any of you have ever bought zucchini before or yellow squash, the skin is very thin and it gets kind of like dehydrated looking and a little bit sad looking after like a couple weeks. Whereas winter squash with its very thick skin, even the delicata squash, which is a little bit thinner, this lasts for a while. So you don't have to worry about it going bad. Back when people didn't have refrigeration, winter squash was their friend. <laughs> So we've got these seeds and a little bit of pulp from the inside right now. So I'm gonna put these to the side and we're gonna keep working on this squash. So I've got a bowl right here next to me and I'm gonna cut these now that they're in this, you know, they're cut lengthwise, I'm gonna cut them into little semi-circle slices. So I'm just gonna remove the ends. Here we go. And 
I'm going to try and cut them so you can see. I'm only doing them like a quarter of an inch thick. I don't want to do them super duper thick because then they will take a long time to cook. This is something we always talk about in our classes. We always want to make recipes that we can fit in this time slot for this class, which are also convenient for you to make in a short time at home. So slicing these a quarter inch thick is a good way to make sure they will cook in the allotted time. So I'm slicing these, I'm like rocking the knife, I'm putting the tip of the knife and rocking it down. So it helps you have a little bit more control. I'm gonna slice the other half. Remove that end. So the tip of the knife goes down and we're moving it down the delicata squash and slicing about a quarter inch thick. So winter squash, the orange color that they have on the inside, most of them, means they are very high in the coloring pigment called carotenoids. That's the orangey reddish color that you see in a lot of fruits and veggies. And whenever you see that color, you're getting a lot of vitamin A. So orange, orange on the inside means lots of vitamin A. So, all right, we've got, we've got these pieces of squash here, sliced up into nice little semicircles. And we're gonna add some other ingredients. We're gonna add canola oil. So the recipe called for about two tablespoons. I'm gonna eyeball it. Also calls for some salt and pepper. I'm gonna eyeball that as well. In the recipe, it says a quarter teaspoon or a half teaspoon rather, and then a quarter teaspoon of the pepper. And we're also doing cinnamon in this as well. Cinnamon is uh, from a category of spices called warming spices. These are, you oftentimes see these, you know, you see this in pumpkin spice, you see cinnamon in uh, other types of winter dishes because cinnamon kind of has a warming effect when you eat it. So something else we are adding to the same bowl is chickpeas. Chickpeas are one of my favorite beans. They have a really good texture. They don't get as mushy as other beans do. And these are just canned. If you had cooked them from uh, the dry state, then they wouldn't be very mushy at all. But obviously canned is much more convenient. So I'm adding those in here too, and we're gonna roast those all together. So I'm grabbing a spoon. And I'm going to toss all this up. And if you feel like it's not quite enough of the cinnamon, you can kind of see where it's, you know, it's coating this one piece a whole lot. So if you want to add a bit more cinnamon, you can. But when you try this in the end, you're going to see how delicious that cinnamon is with winter squash, uh, with this delicata squash. It goes really well with butternut. Um, you know, covered squash is another one, pumpkin, if you ever roast pumpkin, cinnamon is a, is a good one. All right, so I'm going to put this on our sheet pan and stick this in the oven. And I'm going to make sure I spread it out into a, a flat layer as much as I can. And then we'll stick this in the oven at 350. And that'll be for, I'm gonna set the timer for 20 minutes and we'll be going to the oven for some other items throughout this class too. So I'm gonna start by putting this in the oven right now and I'll be right back. As anyone has any questions so far? Anyone's gonna cook? Uh, Nice dinner for Thanksgiving. Any family plans? Oh, he's back. <laughs> um, all right, so our squash is done. Now we're gonna work on the bulgur wheat. So I'm gonna bring over my uh, induction burner real quick. And bulgur wheat is, if you're not, 
really familiar with like different kinds of whole grains, bulgur wheat is a great place to start for a couple of reasons, I will tell you. So we've got our small, uh, small saucepan here, and I'm gonna turn this to high. Sometimes that makes a weird audio feedback. So Lorella, let me know if my audio is weird, but I'm gonna add one cup of bulgur, and I have a cup and a half of water. And we're going to bring that to a boil. I'm just going to stir it in to make sure all the grains are coated. So while that's heating up, bulgur wheat is made by, so the wheat grain is, is harvested. The wheat kernel is actually cooked and then dried out and then chopped up. So that's what bulgur wheat is. So it's a whole grain still because it's not been refined. Yes, it's been chopped up, but it's not been refined. Meaning if you can picture like an, a layer of like an onion with lots of layers, a wheat grain has a lot of layers to it. So when grains are refined and become you know white grains, the outer layers and a couple of the other layers are removed from the grain. So we lose a lot of the protein, a lot of the fiber, a lot of the uh, heart healthy fats. So whole grains have a lot of really beneficial nutrients and when they're refined, we don't get those nutrients. So we always wanna try to eat whole grains when we can. And vulgar wheat is a great option because since it's already been cooked and then dried up and chopped up, it cooks very, very quickly, you'll see. And it's also got a really neutral um, flavor. Bulgur wheat is, its most famous dish is tabbouli, which is a Middle Eastern dish that's got, you know, uh, tomato and cucumber and lots and lots of parsley, lemon juice, olive oil. Uh, if you've ever eaten at a Middle Eastern restaurant or, you know, come to our cafe, we have that a lot as well. Um, so bulgur wheat is a good uh, neutral flavor. So if you're trying to go for new grains, this is basically just like rice. It just cooks more quickly and it's a little bit smaller. So it's still coming to a boil, but luckily this induction burner works very quickly. So what we're gonna do is bring it to a boil. Oh, I forgot to add salt. I'm gonna add a little bit of salt. It's gonna come to a boil and then we're gonna remove it from the heat and just put a lid on it and let it sit there. And it just is gonna sit until we're ready for it. So that's all it takes. And because we're putting this into a salad, we don't need this grain to be hot. We want it to actually cool down a bit, but if it's a little bit warm still, that's okay because we're using kale as our green and kale is very hearty. So if it gets hit with a little bit of a warm ingredient, that's totally fine. So it looks like the bubbles are just starting. I'm gonna wait just a little bit longer. We actually, if any of you uh, come are on campus uh, these days, <laughs> we have in our cafes, uh, every month we have a different superfood that we like to feature. And uh, this month it's whole grains. So Cindy, were you at the elements table yesterday? Um, not yesterday, but I do know there is this every month superfoods thing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we I did one at Elements yesterday. I did today at Courtyard Cafe. Oh, wait, I was tomorrow. there. I was there. Yeah, oh. I remember that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah the, the the bars and the salads. Yes. 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 <laughs> exactly. Okay. I knew I had seen your face recently. Um. Oh, now we're boiling. All right. So I'm gonna put, just set this aside and put a lid on it and let it sit. So we're done with this burner. That's easy. All right, so I'm gonna move this induction burner out of the way, and then we're gonna to get to working with the squash seeds. So I'll show you how to clean those up. So what I'm gonna do, I have this bowl here with the seeds that I put in there when I scoop them out of the squash, and I'm gonna put some water in there, and then I'm just gonna kind of break it all apart. So I'm gonna fill it just a little bit with water. So the seeds are fully submerged. And I'm gonna just pull the seeds off of this pulp. And the pulp we're gonna end up discarding. 
if you really want to be sustainable and reduce your food waste, the pulp is good to use for making a uh, vegetable stock. Just as like any any uh, peels or anything that you take from your produce. It's easier without gloves. So I'm gonna take my gloves off here. The seeds really just like pop right off the pulp. So it makes it super easy. I'm gonna scoop out the pulp that I don't need. Oh, this is a pretty easy batch. Sometimes it sticks pretty well, but we got lucky today. So the seeds float and the pulp kind of sinks down, sometimes floats a little bit, but it helps to separate it. And then later we're gonna do some pomegranate seeds and that's gonna be a, a very similar process to this. All right. So we have a little bit of pulp left, that's totally fine. We're just going to do our best to separate that as much as we can. I'm going to toss this pulp into our compost bin. All right, and now we're going to put this on a sheet pan. I'm going to use my fingers and kind of like scoop them out of here. And I can separate any more pulp that comes onto the sheet pan as well. And we're going to add some spices to these. So these can be made in a million different ways. You can use, if you have a favorite kind of spice, if you love curry, you can add curry powder to these. If you love sweet flavors, you can do cinnamon and sugar. Uh, if you just want salt and pepper, you can do that. If you follow our Instagram, then you'll see that I posted a video on there not too long ago using everything but the bagel seasoning on these seeds, which is really good. And if you don't follow our Instagram, maybe Lorella can put our Instagram name in the chat. <laughs> so I'm gonna just use a towel and dab away a little bit of this water here. Because we don't want it to be too, too wet going into the oven because then everything might stick. All right, so the seasoning that we chose for this recipe is um, cayenne and cumin and salt and pepper, of course. So I'm just gonna spread that out like thin or flat rather, so it doesn't, uh, you know, there's not like multiple layers because then the moisture will get trapped in there. And because it's already wet, we don't need to add any oil. It's gonna stick anyway. So I'm just gonna do some salt. I'm gonna do some pepper. And I've already got my cayenne and cumin measured out here. So I'm gonna do that too. Scoop that all out. Just gonna mix it up. No need to get fancy with this. If you're okay with getting your hands dirty, <laughs> you can also, of course, use a spoon or tongs or something like that. But there we go. So our seeds are ready to go. But before we put this in the oven, I always like to save space as much, much as we can. We're going to make some croutons and prepare those and put them on the same sheet pan and stick those in the oven together. So... I'm gonna just put this sheet pan aside because we're gonna add the, crouton, the croutons to this. So put this behind me. And now we're gonna make croutons. So if any of you have made croutons before, I would love to hear your methods, but this is just extremely simple. If you have a favorite kind of bread, we're just using literally just sliced meat bread. It's nothing fancy. It doesn't even need to be like big and hearty and crunchy or anything like that. This is just normal wheat bread. So what I'm gonna do is just slice some rows. Make sure I got all the way through and then turn it and slice it into cubes. And again, this, putting the tip of the knife on the cutting board and rocking the knife is a really helpful method for having more control with a knife, especially if you're not like, super comfortable with a big sharp chef knife. 
that's a good way to do it. So we've got all these little pieces here and we're gonna put those on the sheet pan. So I'm gonna bring that back over here. We've got our croutons right here for our future croutons. And we're gonna add oil and salt and pepper. So I've got my oil drizzler. This is olive oil. Um, I like that because it has a bit more flavor, but you can also use whatever kind of oil you like. I'm gonna add some salt. I'm gonna add some black pepper. Uh, I just thought another way, another type of bread you could use is uh, like a Parmesan bread or some kind of like bread that has like cheese in it already. And then you would have like Parmesan croutons or you could put some kind of cheese on top of this as well before you stick it in the oven. So just another way to make it more fun. You could also add some fresh herbs or dried herbs. There are so many different things you can add to these croutons. So we've got this sheet pan, we've got the seeds and the, and the future croutons on here. And I'm just gonna go stick those in the oven with the squash at the same temperature. And I'll be right back. So time for another question. And do you have any favorite salad that you like to make? Uh, if anyone wants to share a salad you like. Yeah, the salad, the summer that somebody brought to my house, it was called Asian, um, I forget what, it, Asian coleslaw. And you use uh, ramen noodles, uncooked ramen noodles. Oh. You smash them up and you put it in with like coleslaw and scallions and all kinds of nuts. It's really, really good. Mm, that sounds delicious. People loved Thanks it. For sharing. Yeah. yeah, that sounds great. I think, uh, again, my mom made uh, something like that when I was growing up and she would add like rice vinegar and like a little bit of sugar. And that would kind of help to like you know, you'd let it sit in the fridge for like a few hours and that stuff soaks into the ramen noodles so you don't even have to cook them. So pretty cool trick. Uh, we're gonna be doing another cool trick with acid in this class and it's happening right now. So that was a perfect segue. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> so we're gonna be making, uh, using our kale and this is Tuscan kale. This is my absolute favorite kind of kale. I never go curly because I find that curly is just so tough. And Tuscan kale is just so much easier to work with. And I also love that it's got like a deeper green color. I'm very much about, anyone who's attended before knows that I'm very much about our foods and meals being very colorful and beautiful. So we're gonna uh, take the kale leaves off the stems here. So these stems are very, uh, they're very tough. And oftentimes when you buy kale in the grocery store, like already prepped, they chop it all up through the stems and then you can't really pick that out of the bag. It gets really annoying. So I'm gonna show you a really easy trick for this to take them off the stems. So I'm gonna make sure this is under the camera. So you're gonna pull just a little bit of the leaf off. You're gonna make a circle with your pointer finger and your thumb and you slide it right off. And it's super fast. And then these kale stems, uh, again, can be used just like the, the um, pulp from the squash. They can be used in a stock. Uh, so they have, uh, as our chef, executive chef Rollo likes to say, they have another life. <laughs> They're not dead yet. So we're gonna take the all these leaves off these stems. Uh, another tip that I would say about kale and any kind of leafy green is always make sure that when you buy it in the grocery store, make sure that you're checking carefully for any like bugs or anything like on, underneath the, the leaves, like on the underside of the leaves, sometimes along the stem and in all the little crevices, there might be little buggies hiding in there, which this is nature, bugs happen. So like if you're able to just wash them off, then that's totally fine. Um, but you know, sometimes there'll be a bunch of kale that's got fewer bugs than others. So you go for that one, obviously, because it's easier. <laughs> so we're still taking the leaves off the stems here. 
and we're almost done. There we go. So I'm gonna compost our kale stems. And so I've been laying them on the board all kind of like horizontally like this on top of each other because that helps it helps us when it's time for us to cut. So what I'm gonna do is roll this all up. Got some cinnamon on here, that's all right. Roll it all up and we're gonna use our knife and just slice it into ribbons. And you can slice them nice and thin too. We're gonna go around again because these ribbons can be very long. So I like to then turn it and slice it once down the middle. So now you can see we've got some like skinny pieces that are not too, too long. If you find any, you know, rogue uh, big chunks, then you can rip those with your hands. So this is just one way of preparing kale. You don't have to cut, cut it this way, of course. I find that the, the way you cut your greens really affects your enjoyment of the salad. So for me personally, I always enjoy a salad more when it's cut into these small ribbons because I hate like a big piece of lettuce that I can like hardly get on the fork and it just makes the whole process of eating a salad more annoying. So why make it annoying when you can make it easy? So now that we've got these pieces of kale here, we're going to do that acid trick that we were just talking about with the, the vinegar and the ramen noodles. Acid helps to break things down. So we are using lemon as our acid. Lemon and kale are classic combination. So I'm going to cut this lemon in half. And I'm going to juice it just a little bit, not too much, because we don't need that much. And I'm gonna massage the kale. That's one trick with kale to make it a little bit less tough. If you if you stay away from kale because it's too tough, try this trick, especially if you're using curly kale. You really want to just like smush it up in your hands. It's really it's not gonna smush up because it's a it's you know keeping its shape but the acid does help to soften it up a bit. And that's the reason we're doing this now and not right before we compose the salad because we want this to sit for a little bit. And we want the acid to help soften these kale leaves just enough that they'll be just a bit more palatable. Also though, truthfully, it's not necessary, specifically with this Tuscan kale, it's not necessary to use the acid I've definitely made plenty of salads without doing this process, but this is just a trick to make it a bit more palatable if you tend to shy away from kale. And keep in mind that if you're using a uh, green like spinach or arugula or um, some more like delicate, like spring mix, like more delicate greens, you definitely do not have to do this because those greens are more delicate and the acid will start to actually break down the the delicate leaves and they'll look kind of like wet and a little discolored. So this is a nice hearty green. So this is helpful to use the kale. Not all greens need this. All right, so we've got, this kale is marinated, it's been massaged, it's ready to go. We're gonna put it to the side and I'm gonna check on our uh, vulgar wheat as well and see how that's doing. So I'm just gonna set this aside And we've got our boulder wheat, which looks beautiful. You can see, hopefully, down the bottom, there's only like a teeny bit of water still left there. So just from sitting here, oh, the oven just went off. Just from sitting here, it's absorbed all this liquid and it's nice and fluffy. So I'm just gonna go pull that stuff out of the oven and see how it's looking. I'll be right back. I love the trick about the acid and the into the kale. I always thought it was uh, olive oil, and I thought that the result wasn't really 
really good so i'll try with uh, lemon next time <laughs> yeah i've got um a kale the same thing you chiffon out it and you uh do it with i think we did i did salt and lemon juice and then it's chunk avocado and chunk mango and a couple of other and some some nuts i can't remember which nut i used anyway it was it's a yummy salad Yeah, you can do so many different things with lemon. You can also clean and like yeah, the kitchen and everything. So. There's a restaurant here in town. We did a cooking class with her with a, one of the groups I was with. And she that we cleaned a whole bunch of avocados and smashed those. And then we took the leaves and did we she smashed, I think, garlic down on a, a deal with salt. So it made a paste. And you rub that on the leaves and then you coated it with a deal and you just stack that. And that was the salad with the avocado. Oh. It was great. It was great. That sounds great. <laughs> it was yummy. Wow. wow. That's a great idea. So, all right. The croutons and the seeds are good to go. I'm going to let the squash go a bit longer. But these croutons, I'm going to see if you can hear. Nice and crispy. <laughs> They're nice and crumbly. That's how you want it. And these seeds are just lightly browned. All that other brown is from the seasoning that we use, but just a little bit brown, a little bit crispy. That's how you want it. You don't want to go too far because they can get tough. So I'm going to set these aside until we're ready to use them. And the squash is just going a bit longer. It had some nice browning on one side, but I wanted to flip them over to the other side. And chickpeas, roasted chickpeas are so good. They are like another really great crunchy topping to add to a salad. So lots of crunch in here, which is great. So what's our time? Okay, we're doing well. So yeah, back to this vulgar wheat here. The best way to know if it's ready is to test the texture by eating it, of course. So I'm gonna do that, make sure I don't burn myself. Tastes great. Nice neutral flavor. And the texture is awesome. It's got a little bit of like, you can tell it's a whole grain, you know what I mean? It's not, it doesn't get mushy. It's got a little bit of the, like the fibrous feel to it, which is great because that adds to the kind of like varied color in here. And yeah, this is great. So oh, is my Wi-Fi okay? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, all good. My oh, Wi-Fi sometimes gets messed up. All right, so I'm going to set that um, bulgur wheat aside. And I always encourage that throughout the whole process of cooking whatever you're cooking, as long as it's safe to try something, if you don't need to wait until it's fully cooked, try it. Try your ingredients as you go, because you always want to know what you're putting into something or like what you're adding to your final product. If you try something and you're like, oh, I don't like that as much as I thought I would, then you don't want to add a ton of it like the recipe says. You know, it's recipes are a guideline. You you modify recipes based on what you like. This recipe is for you. So, all right, we've got our bulgur wheat. Next, we're gonna do our dressing. So here's I'll show you a modification option with this this recipe, this sub recipe for our dressing. So I'm gonna use a uh, another mixing bowl here. Actually, I'm just gonna mix it in this bowl I already have, try and save some dishes. So we've got this little bowl. This is a half a cup of plain Greek yogurt. And this is non-fat Greek yogurt, but if you like a really creamy yogurt, you can go more like a full fat yogurt. We've got some maple syrup. This is kind of what's making it like a folly type dish, you know? Maple is like a fall flavor. So we added that. We're gonna be adding a little bit of salt and pepper as well. The recipe calls for a quarter teaspoon of salt and an eighth of a teaspoon of pepper. But as I was just saying, please make sure to modify this to your taste. And we're also gonna add lemon. So I'm gonna use the juicer this time since we're trying to get a lot of juice out of here. I don't spray this all over the place. So I've got, I cut a, I cut one lemon in half to use for the kale. So we're just gonna use the remainder. This is a nice juicy lemon. So we're gonna use the remainder of one half. And I'm gonna mix that up and taste test it and see if I should add any more.
We can use a whisk if we want, but the only whisk in this kitchen is a gigantic commercial size whisk, so it doesn't fit in this tiny bowl. <laughs> but I'm sure you all at home have a more normal size whisk. <laughs> So, all right, this is mixed up. It's nice and like combined. You're not seeing the lemon juice as being separate from the yogurt anymore. And like I said, the way to know if this is how you want it to be is to taste it. So that's what I'm gonna do. Mm, that was a good amount of lemon juice. That was perfect. A little bit tart, but just how I like it. And you could leave it here. You could do nothing else to this, this uh, dressing and it would be awesome, but I really, really, really love olive oil. So I'm gonna add some of that also. <laughs> so we'll just do a little bit of olive oil. Also oil is very good for us, olive oil especially. So that's what salad dressings are. So by adding oil, we're not like, making a weird concoction or anything. We're just making this more like a salad dressing. So again, I wanna mix this as much as I can until it's uh, very well combined. So the color changed a little bit. I'm not sure if you can see, it's a little bit uh, more yellowy because of the olive oil. And there's a little bit of like olive oil still around the edges. So I'm just gonna keep on going a little. So, Greek yogurt in salad dressings is such a great way when you're making a vegetarian meal, making some kind of a yogurt sauce, whether it's a salad dressing or just a garlicky yogurt lemony sauce to put on top of your vegetables or something. It's such an awesome way to add protein to a vegetarian meal. So sauces and garnishes, as you can see in this salad with lots of ingredients, sauces and garnishes add so much to a meal. It's not just, you know, the way it looks or the way it tastes, but nutrition-wise as well. All right, so I'm going to try this. Yep, perfect, if I do say it for myself. Perfect dressing. All right, so that part is done. Now we're just getting to the end of everything. So we're going to get our pomegranate seeds out of the pomegranate. We're going to cut up the plum. And we're going to cut up some radishes and then it's going to be time to combine everything. So I think before I do that, I'm going to pull the squash out of the oven. So I'll be right back again. So who's going to try to do the, the salad at home for Thanksgiving or, or any other day? I'm probably going to try it for Thanksgiving. <laughs> it looks easy enough. Like, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to probably try it too. <laughs> Let's look at that. Yum. Look at how amazing this looks. I wish our sheet pan was a little nicer looking, but these, this squash right here is so nice and colorful. Got ground on the other side. The chickpeas. I want you to like hear the sound of the chickpeas. I don't know if you can hear it. They're definitely crunchy. They're so, I love a crunchy, crunchy chickpea. So yeah, these are just gonna sit aside and cool off a bit while we do the rest of the ingredients. So that's also the beauty of making a nice party salad is that you don't have to have everything be, you know, coming out of the oven at the same time, which is usually what we aim for in this class. Uh, instead, you can just make your ingredients at whatever point you feel like and let them cool off, and then you add them in the salad at the end. All right. So for this pomegranate, I'm going to get a little bit of water in a bowl. Enough water to submerge like a half of the pomegranate. So this is what a whole pomegranate looks like here. So I'm gonna show you, this is the more complicated process. You could also just buy pomegranate seeds already <laughs> taken out of the fruit. They're of course a little bit expensive at the store, but it saves you a whole lot of time. So it's up to you, doesn't matter. 
Um, so what I'm going to do here is cut this pomegranate in half. But first, actually, I want to show you. I want to try and get the right angle so you can see. Okay. So do you see how this is kind of like, it's kind of got like one, two, three, four, five sides, six sides. This pomegranate has like corners to it. So pomegranates, even though when you cut into them, they look kind of crazy inside, but there actually is, you know, the, the growth pattern has a, a method to it, I guess. <laughs> so we're going to try and, I feel like I don't always have success with this, but I'm going to try. So what I'm doing is I'm using one of the flat sides. So like a flat side here, not one of the corners. And I'm going to cut it in half through that flat side. And here's an example. This was the flat side. This was the corner. So you can see there's way more of this like pithy stuff on the flat side. And the corner, the seeds come all the way out to the corner. So that can kind of help to guide you when you're trying to like cut your pomegranate into segments. You can cut the, the corners and the seeds will be more like readily available to you. However, honestly, I feel like when you cut a pomegranate, it's just, you do whatever you can to cut it because <laughs> it's tricky. And what we're gonna do is submerge it in the water here. And you'll see, this is gonna be the opposite of the squash seeds where the squash seeds uh, floated, pomegranate seeds sink. So I'm just kind of breaking this apart and popping the seeds out here. And when you do it underwater, it helps. It helps to separate those things. Sometimes it's hard to get them all out, but that's all right. And then you'll see, so the seeds sunk down to the bottom and this is floating. So it helps to keep them separate when you pull these seeds out in a bowl of water. That's a good piece. <laughs> so it's satisfying when you rip it apart and it's like all the seeds are sitting right there waiting for you. So you can just kind of like lightly use your thumb and like push them and they like dislodge from the white part. So rather than me wasting all of my time, not wasting, spending all of my time doing this and with you watching me, I do have some already in a bowl as I showed you. So we're gonna jump ahead to that. I'm just gonna finish this one segment here. All right, let me compost these pieces. And so when you get to this point, you can just skim, skim those white pieces off the top. And some of them sunk down to the bottom with the seed because they were still attached, but you skim the white pieces off the top. And now you've got all of these beautiful seeds that were sitting down at the bottom. Can't really see the color. Of course, you all know what pomegranate seed color actually looks like. They're like this neon magenta color, but they sunk down to the bottom nice and easily. So that's great. So I'm just going to set the rest of this pomegranate aside. Also, beware of the purple juice that can stain anything. <laughs> it's all over this cutting board now. So beware if you're not wearing an apron when you make this. I'm going to just wipe it on one of our cloths here. Get it out of the way. All right. So we've got those pomegranate seeds. Now I'm going to cut the plum and the radishes. So right here we have just a you know normal, like maybe a slightly small size plum. And I've got just a couple red radishes here. Radishes have a really interesting flavor. So this is something that I would definitely recommend you uh, try before you put it all into your salad. I'm just gonna put on my cut glove because we're gonna be slicing this very thinly and I don't want to accidentally <laughs> slip. Let me grab some other gloves here. So we chose plums to put into this because plums are like, you know, at the very end of their season right now. And they have a really, really beautiful um, color and texture. Uh, you know, any kind of stone fruit, it they have like a, uh, I don't know like the way, the right word to use, but they're very like 
solid. <laughs> so like, it's nice that they keep their shape. It's not like an orange or something that's juicy and messy all over the place. So, all right, I'm gonna take this radish here. This is a really tiny little guy. And I'm gonna, right now there already is a flat spot of this because the branch, uh, the stem was cut off. So we're gonna sit it on that flat part so it doesn't roll all over the place. And I'm gonna use that trick again where we put the tip of the knife down and rock it down. We're gonna cut this into very thin slices. As thin as we can. Because this flavor is so powerful, it's like peppery, uh, we definitely want it to be thin. And I'm not gonna, if you get to the point where you don't feel comfortable cutting it without cutting your finger, stop, it's not worth the risk. <laughs> So I'm gonna put those over there. I'm just gonna do the same thing to the other guy. There's not a flat surface, so I'm gonna make a flat surface to try and make it a little bit safer for me. So now it's nice and flat there, it's not rolling around. I'm gonna take the widest. This one I could cut like lots of thin or uh, narrow slices, but instead I want wide ones. So I'm gonna go Slice it nice and thin. And there are also different kinds of radishes. There are some, uh, our chef, when we were figuring out what kind of radishes we wanted to order for this, he told me about a radish called a purple ninja radish that's purple on the inside. It's purple like a purple potato is on the inside, which is really cool. So lots of different colors. If you want a different kind of color in your salad, I support you. <laughs> so, all right, now we've got our plum. And we're gonna cut this up as well. I have a trick for cutting the plum too. So where there's a seam, it's kind of hard to see on the video. There's a seam on the plum right here. I'm gonna cut against that, perpendicular to that because it makes it easier to pull out the pit. So I'm gonna spin this around and then twist the halves. And now you'll see the pit is sticking out sideways instead of laying flat. So if I'm lucky, I might be able to just twist that pit and pull it right out. We'll see. Sometimes you can't get it on the first try. So that's right. I'm gonna cut it. I'm gonna cut this into thin wedges. So I'm gonna keep it flat here and I'm gonna do my knife around it like this to make wedges. So I meet in the middle. And if you're not comfortable with this method, you can always just slice it thin the same way we did with the radishes. But it's just a slightly different shape. So just in the same way that we like to do different um, colors, different sizes, different textures, we also like different shapes. Any way to make your meal more interesting helps with your overall satisfaction of your meal. Plum slices go over here. I'm gonna do the one with the pit in it now. And hopefully I'll be able to pull that out after a couple of slices. It's very lodged in there. So we'll keep doing a few more slices. You could also get, so this is a, a red plum. There are black plums that have more of like a reddish purpley inside. So you could do different um, colored plums as well. So I'm gonna keep cutting into wedges. We're almost there. All right. Okay, so we've got not lots of uh, plum slices. We've got lots of radish slices here. This, these radishes are so beautiful. They have like a red, skin and a perfectly white inside. So cool. So, okay, at this point, we're gonna make our salad. So I'm gonna take my gloves back off because I wanna do that with my bare hands. I'm gonna grab a mixing bowl. Actually, I'm gonna take the bowl with the kale in it. Here we go. And we're gonna mix some of the ingredients first before the others. So what we're gonna add in here first is the bulgur. And you can choose to add as much or as little of this bulgur as you want. Um, I think I'm gonna, you can always add more, you can't take away. So I'm gonna start with just a little. If I feel, if I feel like adding more than I will. 
I'm also going to add some squash and chickpeas to this too. So this is cooled down a little bit. I'm just going to scoop it on in there. There, I think we'll start with that. And I'm going to toss this up with my hands because I feel like with the, the delicate delicata squash here, we don't want it to be, uh, you know, totally broken apart by using tongs. But if you were very careful with your tongs, then it would be okay. But these really beautiful half moon slices, these semicircles, uh, you want to preserve that. So tossing this up. You can kind of look at it as a composed salad and think, hmm, do I want more squash in here? Do I want more bulgur wheat? I think this is a good mix for my preference. So I think I'm going to leave it there. And now what I'm going to add a little bit of is the dressing. I'm not going to do all of the dressing right now. I'm just going to do a little bit. Because like I said, you can always add more, but you can't take away. That is a really, really good cooking lesson. <laughs> Probably something that we've all learned the first time we accidentally added way too much of something and ruined the dish. So don't need to do that, uh, add too much right off the bat. So I'm gonna just grab a spoon here and I'm gonna spoon a little bit of the dressing in here and toss it around. Not too, too much right off the bat. Okay, so at this point I'm gonna use my tongs because I don't wanna get all dressing all over my hands. Lightly toss it around. And this dressing, uh, another great thing about creamy dressing is you can tell what it coated already. When it's white, you can see where it touched. So you know if you need to add more or not. All right. And I'm gonna put this on a plate and we're gonna put the rest of the uh, ingredients on the plate. So let's see, we've got a little plate here. I'm gonna put our salad, making a big mess. So like I said, this could be a side salad or a uh, an entree salad as well. So the portion really determines that. the portion of the overall salad and the proportion of the ingredients. All right, so there's one other ingredient we have not talked about yet, and that is our cheese. So this can be done without cheese, but today we're using a smoked cheddar. Uh, it's got those cool grid lines on it from the smoking process. And I'm also using a Y peeler, one of our favorite tools in these classes, because it's a nice ergonomic way of peeling something. So what I'm gonna do is hold this, and the peeler is going away from me, and I'm gonna go down, And you can peel pieces as big as you want or as small as you want. And I think that's good. If you, ever, if you choose to go with this smoked cheddar, it is a very, uh, you know, this, the smokiness is very strong. This is a, the brand is Tillamook with a T. So if you choose to go with that one, it's very smoky. So you definitely don't need a ton of it. So we've got our cheese tucked in there. We're going to use our our uh, plums, tuck those in there as well. Like to make sure that all the colors are showing. Tuck those in, we've got our radish slices. Pop those all around. We've got our croutons and our squash seeds. These croutons came out so perfectly crunchy. They're great. So I'm just going to tuck those in here too. We've got our seeds, our uh, squash seeds. I'm going to grab some of those. So this, the light colored seeds really like, you can start to see the difference in color with all the layers of the ingredients. And I believe our final ingredient is the pomegranate seeds. And then I always like to 
top everything with some olive oil because I love it, like I mentioned. <laughs> so I'm gonna do some pomegranate seeds, try and make sure it doesn't fall all over the place. Although I feel like one of the most fun things about making a salad is if you have those types of bowls or I at home, I don't know what they're called. At home, I call it a bowl plate. It's as big as a plate, but it's it's a bowl, <laughs> like a pasta plate, pasta bowl kind of thing. Those are great for salads because you could just like drop all your ingredients and they don't fall off the plate. They just, they kind of go all over the place haphazardly, but they stay in the bowl plate. So that's nice. So we've got our olive oil and that's our final. Oh, and we're gonna drizzle a little bit more of our other salad dressing. Now that we're done assembling, we can do a bit more of this dressing. And the way this recipe came out for the dressing, it's not super duper thin, so it doesn't drizzle just as much as the olive oil does. So you can just do little drops of it, which actually kind of unintentionally makes it look a bit more festive with the white, pomegranate, plums, we've got all the different colors, all the different shapes and textures and all kinds of things. So that is our salad. And we've got lots of, this was only one portion, so we have a lot more stuff here. Lots of extra plum slices to eat and all that fun stuff. So that's that. What do you guys think? <laughs> Looks great. Thank you. How many people do you think that would serve like a small salad, just like a little appetizer kind of thing? What do you think? So I think that this this salad, the the way that looks big. This is, I would say, bigger than an appetizer salad. This might be like two times an appetizer portion. Um, Lorella, do you mind putting us on the grid view? So I don't know if you're able to do that for everybody, but just so we can see everybody at the end. Um, I'm going to do that for myself, the gallery. Uh, so yeah, this is like a two person appetizer portion. And with everything else we've made, we probably have like a total of maybe like six or eight appetizer portions. If you're doing like an entree portion like this, then it would be more like four servings. Yeah. And what if people really hate kale? What would you substitute? Good question, because I know kale is kind of like a polarizing ingredient. So I would say um, spinach goes well because it's the same color as kale. Uh, it's still that dark green. But if you wanted to even do like romaine, because that's the most like well widely accepted green, I think that would also be totally fine because all of these other ingredients are so, you know, colorful and, and all that stuff. So even if you're lacking that deep green color, that's Totally fine. I, I'm just wondering about like, does it have to have the kale to give it a certain flavor or can I use romaine? Because a lot of people I know don't really care for kale. Right. So romaine is more like watery than kale. The, the right. crunch that you have in romaine, it's just the water content. So kale yeah. is not quite as watery as romaine is. Um, so it would be, you might need like, a. you might need like, if you're talking about the ratio of kale to the other ingredients, you might need more romaine than you would kale to get, you know, the same, I don't know, the same kind of flavor. Um, but yeah, I mean, another fun thing I feel like is if you're making a salad like this that has so many ingredients in it, it might be fun if you put it out with like people can add their own toppings type of thing. So maybe the base is only the greens, the bulgur and the squash and chickpeas. And then people can add as much dressing as they want. They can add whatever toppings they like. So that's depending on how many people you're having over, if that's feasible, uh, that might be a good way to go. So people can choose their own adventure with their- Maybe you can make this like a day before and then keep in the fridge. Yes, I'm glad you asked. So if you want to do that, I would keep the dry ingredients and the wet ingredients separate. And also, um, I wouldn't add the dressing until you're ready to go. So like, you could prep all these ingredients, you could cook all the things that need to be cooked and put them in the fridge. And that's another great thing is they don't need to be reheated because they're going in a salad. Um, but the dressing, I would definitely wait until like uh, not long before you serve it to toss the dressing in. 
But because it's kale, and like I said, kale is heartier, you don't have to worry so much about it getting like totally mushy like you would with, like if you were to do the romaine, Barbara, then I would not uh, mix that until just before because the romaine is more delicate. And I like, the, I like the tip on your recipe that you had so you can mix the salad in a small covered jar because that's that way you shake it and you're easy, you can pour it, put it in the fridge, do whatever. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of having it in a big mixing bowl, you could definitely put it in a something that can be shaken, make it easier for yourself. Thank you. Have a great holiday. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. And hopefully we'll see you next time. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.